Okay, I, we're going to go ahead and get started here so we can not be too, too off time. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to the genomic, or Genome Stability and Dynamics session. Uh, there, me and Jeff are co-chairs, and uh, this is going to be a good session. There's some longer talks and some shorter talks, so just remember for those that are um, speaking to make sure to watch the time so we have some time for questions. And uh, we have fairly, I'll stand in front here, I'm not good at standing in front. Um, the talks are all using tetrahymena, but we're looking at a couple different aspects of genome stability and dynamics, and we've got some replication talks and repair talks, and uh, it looks like a good session. So um, our first speaker will be Jeff, and he's going to talk about the genetic and epigenetic control of DNA replication in tetrahymena. Thanks, Josh. So. Down, not left, right. Down, up, down. Okay. So, uh, thanks. Thanks for the introduction and uh, welcome to the session. So. What I'm going to do to, in the time I have is tell you about work that we've done in the last couple of years um, studying uh, aspects of DNA replication, some of which we've worked on for a while and some of which are, are, are fairly new to us. So um, for the last 25 years now, 26 years, I've been working with tetrahymena and, and I've been using it as a model system to study the control of eukaryotic DNA replication. And replication initiates at specific sites and chromosomes. I'm going to try this pointer here. Specific sites and chromosomes are termed, are termed origins of replication. And these initiation events are regulated by the recruitment of factors that allow for site-specific initiation of DNA replication. One of the advantages of working with tetrahymena is that it harbors both natural and artificial mini chromosomes shown here, and this allows us to uh, explore the genetic uh, composition, the context of the DNA sequences and the chromosomes that are replicated. Um, we've used forward and reverse genetic approaches to identify cis-acting regulatory determinants and their specific DNA sequences that control replication initiation. And more recently, in collaboration with Yifan Lu's lab, we've studied uh, the epigenetic regulation, the chromatin context that regulates DNA replication. And we've also used biochemistry and reverse genetics to study transacting factors. They include the conserved uh, eukaryotic origin recognition complex, novel proteins that we've identified, TIF1P, and a novel non-coding RNA, which is actually a component of the tetrahymena origin recognition complex. So in, ad in addition to studying these questions, one of, the, one of the nice things about this model system is it provides you the opportunity to study what we, I define as, or describe as alternative DNA replication programs. So whereas in a normal cell cycle, you replicate in S phase, you then segregate your chromosomes and divide, there are other programs in which you take a diploid nucleus, for example, and generate a polyploid nucleus. That's called endoreplication. It's a genome-wide event. It occurs in many eukaryotes and in tetrahymena, and it typically is associated with terminal differentiation. In tetrahymena, it, it's the beginning of the life of the organism that occurs during macronuclear development. Another program is gene amplification, where a specific segment of a chromosome is replicated to a higher copy number and the, while the other chromosomes are not being replicated. So you get selective amplification of, of, of a small subset of genes. So uh, the developmental program of tetrahymena uh, takes a diploid germline nucleus and converts it into polyploid macronucleus. And this involves, as, as we all know in this room, the massive reorganization of chromosomes. So the chromosomes are fragmented, uh, the IES elements are removed, telomeres are, 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 are um, added to the ends of the fragmented chromosomes. The non-RDNA chromosomes, the bulk of the genome is replicated to about 45 copies, and the RDNA is replicated from two copies to 9,000 copies per cell. 
Now, one of the beauties about tetrahymena is you can synchronize this process and have entire populations of cells that are doing this all at the same time. And so from, a, from my Drosophila colleague who works on this, uh, in flies, you've got salivary glands, you've got nurse cells, you've got to do all these dissections. Tetrahymena, we all know, you just grow up a large vat of cells, you make them, and then you're good to go. So it gives us opportunities that, that we're able to uh, exploit, um, to take advantage of. Once this, uh, these events are completed, these chromosomes then need to be licensed so that they replicate just once per cell cycle. So uh, in the meeting in Italy last year, I talked to you about a new DNA replication program that we discovered when we were studying the intra-S phase DNA damage checkpoint response. This program is activated by hydroxyurea, and, uh, it, and, and, uh, and hydroxyurea is, a, a, is an inhibitor of DNA replication. It, it starves the cell for DNA precursors. And in most eukaryotes, and in, in all other examined eukaryotes, HU-induced arrest just basically blocks initiation and elongation by reversible phosphorylation of replication proteins. And that's reversed when the HU is removed. In the case for tetrahymena, uh, the ORC complex and MCM proteins are actually degraded. When you remove hydroxyurea, cells will replicate their entire genome prior to the replenishment of ORC subunits. And so today what I'm going to do is tell you about uh, other work that we've done studying gene amplification and endoreplication in the developing macronucleus, as well as the epigenetic control of DNA replication by chromatin modifications. The work here was done by a former graduate student in my lab, Zhao Zhu Meng, and this work was done by multiple people in my lab listed here, Zhao Zhu, uh, Miguel, and Chun Zhao, in collaboration with uh, Shan Gao and Yi Fan Lu. So uh, before I get into the details, what I need to do is give you a little bit more background about, um, about the, the major workhorse that we work with, which is the RDNA mini chromosome. The RDNA is a 21 kilobase mini chromosome. All of the regulatory sequences that control DNA replication reside within the five prime non-transcribed spacer. This is a palindromic mini chromosome, so two copies of a 10.3 KB segment in an inverted orientation. When you blow up this region, what you see is a very precisely defined chromatin structure with several, three nucleosome-free regions shown here, here, and here. The regions shown here in domain one and two function as the origins of replication. They're the sites where replication initiates to amplify the RDNA, and they're also the sites that are used to replicate the RDNA during the vegetative cell cycle when it's, re it's replicated once per cell division. We've identified sequence-specific DNA determinants, and the type one elements shown here are the binding sites for ORC, the origin recognition complex. Type elements at this nucleosome-free region at the promoter regulate transcription of ribosomal RNA genes, and they act at a distance to regulate these upstream origins. So this precisely defined chromatin structure um, uh, includes, uh, um, uh, is, is at the borders of these nucleosome-free regions are conserved DNA sequences, which are binding sites for other proteins that probably play a role in preventing uh, the, uh, uh, preventing uh, the, the chrome nucleosomes from invading that region. So we've got a defined chromatin structure, um, cis-acting DNA sequences that control replication, amplification and vegetative replication. So what do we know about chromatin uh, in tetrahymena? Within the context of transcriptional control, a fair bit. Uh, DNA replication, it's, it's a work in progress. So what, uh, what we learned in my lab several years ago, but never published on, is that specific nucleosomes in the 5' NTS are hyperacetylated dur during RDNA gene amplification. And the relevance of that remains to be determined. Um, when we induce uh, replication stress with hydroxyurea, we see a global hypoacetylation of histone H3. Uh, and the macronuclear chromosomes or the macronucleus itself gets much more compact, suggesting that the chromatin structure is, uh, is, um, is organized differently uh, in these uh, uh, replicating under, under these conditions. Uh, now, several years ago, uh, Shangao and Yifan Lu uh, discovered uh, H3 
K27 methyltransferase. And when they initially examined this TXR1 knockout mutant, uh, they identified um, a, a number of important characteristics. Excess single-strand DNA, uh, macronuclear genome instability, uh, impaired replication fork elongation, and in collaboration with them, we identified aberrant DNA replication media, intermediates that are generated um, in this mutant background. So the tools for studying DNA replication, three of which I'm going to uh, uh, present some data for. 2D gel electrophoresis allows to study DNA replication intermediates in specific chromosomes. And we'll be looking at the rDNA origin region and its regulation. Uh, DNA fiber analysis allows us to look at replication in the remainder of the genome. And quantitative PCR is a method that we've utilized to look at changes in copy numbers so we can look at the kinetics of rDNA amplification and non-rDNA replication. So 2D gel analysis, you separate molecules, um, you isolate DNA, uh, do a restriction enzyme digest, and then you, after enriching for your replication intermediates, you separate your molecules based in the first dimension on size only, so low molecular weight to, to high molecular weight DNA, unreplicated DNA, replication intermediates, and then in the second dimension, based on their size and their shape. So if a segment of the genome is passively replicated, you'll have one fork entering from the left or right, transiting through that DNA segment. That generates a simple Y arc with this characteristic pattern. If you initiate within that fragment, you have bidirectional replication, a replication bubble with two forks moving outwards. That generates this pattern. Now, you don't need to be an expert for 2D gels to uh, appreciate, uh, I'll skip that, um, the fact that these patterns look very different. This is replication from the 5' NTS during the vegetative cell cycle, and this is during the early phase of rDNA gene amplification. So this is a bubble to Y arc initiation within the fragment, that's the bubble, uh, asymmetrically in those origins that I showed you in that uh, previous slide. That pattern that you see here is faintly detectable over here, uh, and, but, and then a new pattern is generated, and that's due to the activation of the developmentally programmed replication fork barrier. So, uh, so dynamic changes in replication initiation and fork elongation during rDNA gene amplification. So one of the things that we discovered in studying DNA replication during macronuclear development with um, antibodies to uh, look at the uh, abundance and regulation of the replication origin recognition complex and other proteins is that ORC protein levels fluctuate widely or wildly during, during macronuclear, during development. Their levels increase relative to the vegetative cell cycle um, when the micronucleus alone is being replicated. And when macronuclear replication occurs, their levels drop by literally a factor of 30. So this is kind of surprising because what, you're gonna, what you see is that ORC proteins are level, ORC protein levels are lowest during macronuclear development when the amount of DNA that needs to be replicated is the greatest. So to begin to try and understand this, we wanted to uh, get a, a handle on the events that are occurring during this time. And so we wanted to get a better understanding of endo-replication and gene amplification. And the question we asked was simply, what, uh, what are, we set out to assess the changes in rDNA and non-rDNA copy number in the developing macronucleus. So um, to get a, a handle on the kinetics of, of, the, of the, this process. So the way we did this experiment was we generated or utilized heterocarian strains with tagged rDNA and non-rDNA alleles, shown here in blue and in orange. We then set up a mating and then analyzed the copy number of these chromosomes in progeny cells using quantitative PCR. So you're going to start off with a low copy number and then go to a high copy number, showed by this increase in shading. For the rDNA, a range from 2 to 9,000 copies. For the non-rDNA, 2 to 45 copies. Using this approach, 
we were able to generate this following profile for the kinetics of rDNA and non-rDNA replication in the developing macronucleus. This is a log two plot, which allows us to, to, to be able to look at um, these vastly different changes in copy number. There are four points I'd like to make that are listed here and that I'm going to walk through now. The first is that rDNA amplification uh, initiates prior to endoreplication of the non-rDNA chromosomes, as you can see through this increase in rDNA copy number uh, relative to the non-rDNA. The second point is that both events, at least in a temporal within the population occur concurrently. So you're amplifying the rDNA when you're endo-replicating non-rDNA chromosomes. The third point is that both programs are down-regulated in a coordinated manner. So you can see a pretty clear shift in the slope for replication of non-rDNA and non-rDNA chromosomes during this time interval. And the last point is that the slope for the increase in rDNA copy number and non-rDNA copy number later in development is pretty comparable. So what that suggests to us is that the rDNA is actually replicated in two modes. Early in development, it's amplified, and later in development, it's endo-replicated with the remainder of the genome. So we set out to um, um, study this in more detail now by looking by 2D gel electrophoresis at the DNA replication intermediates that are generated when the rDNA has switched to this endo-replication mode. I'm going backwards now. Okay, there we go. So the data I'm going to show you here, I want to just by, make life easy for all of us by just illustrating this point that's probably going to be animated right now. Yes. Okay. This arrow indicates, uh, is meant to highlight the pattern of DNA replication intermediates that looks different, dramatically different from what we see in vegetative cells. So this is a Y arc, and it's a simple Y arc. It comes down uh, and intersects uh, the, 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 what we call the arc of linears, non-replicating DNA fragments. And what's supposed to happen, and what happens in, in, in normally, is that if you passively replicate a DNA molecule, that Y arc is going to intersect this spot, which is unreplicated DNA. It's very clear that this Y arc is, is shifted to the left. So we have aberrant DNA replication intermediates that are, are generated during macronuclear development. It's a simple Y arc or a complete Y arc, and that suggests that this chromosome, at least in a subset of molecules, is the origin is now being passively replicated. The origin in the 5' NTS is not being utilized. Now, when we look in the TXR1 knockout, the histone methyltransferase mutant, here looking in vegetative cells, we see a very similar pattern with these apparent replication intermediates. And here's the endo-replicating cells, and here's the vegetative TR TXR1 knockout mutant. So, uh, Yifan and Shan uh, previously showed that there's excess single-strand DNA that is generated um, uh, in the TXR1 mutant strain. And the pattern of these replication intermediates raises the possibility that this, that this aberrant migration is not simply due to the presence of excess single-strand single DNA, but due to the formation of persistent RNA-DNA hybrids. And this was reported uh, several years ago in the yeast senataxin mutant. And senataxin uh, encodes an RNA helicase that's involved in removing nascent transcripts from their templating DNA strand. This pattern is l virtually identical to what we see in senataxin mutants. Now, the authors that uh, discovered these aberrant replication intermediates in yeast did an experiment which we repeated in tetrahymena. What they did was they took their replication intermediates, they digested with ribonuclease A and with the single-strand nuclease, mung -B nuclease, and then they looked at whether that altered the migration pattern of these replication intermediates. And here's the uh, vegetative control. You can see the simple bubble, the bubble to Y-arc intermediates. 
Here's the endo-replicating and TXR1 knockout mutants with uh, out mung bean nuclease, aberrant RIs, with mung bean nuclease treatment. Now this aberrant Y arc is converted to a simple Y arc in both the endo-replicating and TXR1 mutant. So we have reason to believe or at least to suspect that, that we have aberrant replication intermediates um, generated through the formation of RNA-DNA hybrids. So um, one possibility is that if this was true, that those hybrids are generated from stalled ribosomal RNA transcripts. If that's the case, then if we look at a coding region fragment shown here, this qua one fragment, we, we should expect to see aberrant replication intermediates. And we don't see that. So here's wild type endo, uh, endo replicating wild type cells and the TXR1 mutants, simple Y arcs. If we do a set of restriction digests now that allow you to look at smaller DNA fragments so that uh, now, for example, in this HaHa1 fragment, where uh, the, you, you're looking at a segment that does not contain ribosomal RNA coding regions, what we see is that those aberrant Y arcs are converted to, uh, uh, are at least in the TXR1 mutant, still migrate as aberrant uh, uh, replication intermediates. So this suggests, and then this is another digest which, which cuts just, gives you, you know, about 30 nucleotides of ribosomal RNA if you were actually transcribing ribosomal RNA. You see the aberrant replication intermediates are still maintained. So that suggests to us that in, in, this, in this mutant background um, and in endo-replicating cells, that the region that's, that's responsible for generating these aberrant RIs maps to the non-coding 5' NTS. So if RNAs are involved, it would, they would be non-coding RNAs. They would be novel RNAs that had not, have not yet been described. We're in the process of addressing this using antibodies that recognize, specifically recognize RNA-DNA hybrids. And those are ongoing experiments in the lab. So um, for the last part of my talk and the time I have remaining, I just want to tell you about uh, the work that we've done studying replication fork elongation using this DNA uh, fiber analysis. So what we're doing is a pulse chase experiment. We're labeling with IDU, chasing with CLDU, we're lysing cells, we're stretching out DNA fibers, and then using antibodies to probe for replication uh, events that have occurred. So you can look at replication initiation, replication elongation. You can map the distance between initiation sites or origins of replication. That's described as inner origin distance. So when we look at endo-replicating cells, what we see is that the inner origin distance decreases in the endo-replicating chromosomes. Now this is actually um, a little bit surprising because that suggests that, and so here's the, here's the difference, 27 versus 24.5 kilobases. That's a bit surprising because we have less ORC, so we would expect there would be more initiation events if you were initiating by a conventional ORC-dependent mechanism. When we look in the endo-replicating, uh, or in the TXR1 mutant, we see the opposite situation. So the distance between replication initiation sites increases significantly. Fewer origins are activated, and the question is, how does TXR1 modulate origin activation? So um, one possibility is that it's through the differential uh, uh, modification of chromatin. So TXR1, shown here in orange, uh, mRNA levels are cell cycle regulated. They peak prior to the onset of macronuclear S phase. And in experiments that we published years ago, we showed that the licensing or the uh, replication origins, the recruitment of ORC to replication origins is cell cycle regulated. And in G2 phase, ORC is distributed on chromosomes, and in G1 phase, it localizes to the origin, origins, okay? So the model we have is uh, that uh, TXR1 plays a role in the epigenetic control of replication origins. You've got multiple origins that could be chosen through histone modification. This one is chosen. 
Uh, and that leads to the recruitment of ORC to that initiation site and, and the assembly of other proteins. Now, regulation could be occurring downstream. This is a working model, and, uh, and so, um, but it gives us a place to start. So I'd like to acknowledge the people in my lab that did the work, um, uh, Zheng Zhao Meng primarily, Brian Burquist who did some of the early work, and Miguel and Chen Zhao who've been working most recently on this project. Thank you and time for questions. With the uh, aberrant re replication intermediates, is it possible that what you're seeing is the effect of residual RNA primer? Uh, RNA primer for, for, for lagging strands, and you're saying for uh, yeah. Okasaki fragments. That's right, yeah. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think so. I, mean, I, don't I, think I so. realize it would be very short, but... But I don't know what, what your, how sensitive yeah, is that's, your that's a good, to I've never, I've Actually, I've never thought about that, so it's a good question, and, and, uh, and I'm not going to belabor not giving you an answer, so, okay, sure. I'll think about that. Yeah. Jerry. Jeff, uh, from a lot of dissections, we learned that there's, um, you know, the amplification process, there's a lot of DNA damage that happens at these amplicons in Drosophila. I was just wondering, I mean, do you see a lot of DNA damage associated with amplification of this locus, and particularly since you have potentially an R loop there that should be even more problematic. You yeah. Know, um, it, and, you know, especially since then it's passively replicated after, it could pose a problem. We, 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 have, we, haven't, we haven't done any specific experiments to uh, address that question. So uh, I, I can't, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have an answer for you on that. And we'll, we'll talk over a beer. Okay. Anyone else? All right, on to the next speaker.